When you're sad and blue And everything is putting you down You know the world keeps spinning around You know you're not alone Yes, with MS, the world keeps spinning around, but you're not alone. Welcome to the 10 Minutes for MS podcast, in which we share information about MS in just 10 minutes. In this episode, I'm glad to welcome Dr. Ree, physician specialized in stem cell therapy. Hi, Dr. Ree. Welcome to 10 Minutes for MS podcast. Thank you for having me. Stem cell therapy is such a topic that everybody wants to know what it is. There isn't much awareness about it. So we need to reach out to people to tell them why someone should offer stem cell therapy. When was first stem cell therapy ever done? And why till now is there no awareness about it? So what happens is that stem cell therapy has been around for a long time. So even back in the 60s, when uh, when patients first started getting bone marrow transplants for leukemia and the, and some other uh, blood disorders, uh, right? So doctors would do a bone marrow aspirate and then they would uh, wipe out the, the bone marrow with chemotherapy and then they would um, reinfuse this bone marrow aspirate that they had taken. Now, we didn't know back at the time, but really what was repopulating the this bone marrow and these different uh, cell populations where the stem cells within that bone marrow. So the difference is that in the last couple of years, maybe since the early 2000s, what we started doing or what's been happening in this whole industry is that these stem cells from the bone marrow and from other sources are now being isolated from that bone marrow, are being separated, are being cultured and expanded, which basically means we just grab the stem cells and, and we know that a stem cell can replicate, right? So in order for for a type of cell to be considered a stem cell, they need to have that that ability to replicate. From one, we get two, two, we get four, eight, 16, 32, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what we've been doing recently is in certain research uh, facilities, what's, what's most commonly being done is culturing, expanding these cells. So basically you're separating the stem cells from everything else that is in the bone marrow. You're putting them in an incubator with specific growth factors. And so you're basically telling these cells to start replicating and they start growing and start becoming larger populations. Mm -hmm. And then stem cell therapy basically means putting that tool in the hands of a physician. It has to be a physician. It cannot be like a chiropractor or like a nurse. So then the doctors can use them to specifically address certain issues and certain concerns. So if you grab those stem cells and you inject them, let's say in a tendon or in a ligament or in a bone that is not healing, they will promote healing right there. If you put them IV and they can get to the lungs, they will heal right there. Um, systemically as well, they will regulate the immune system. And the important part is that contrary to when we we're very used to thinking in pharmaceutical terms, right? So if we have this, this symptom, we take this medication that will block that symptom. Really, that's how most uh, drugs work right now. Mm -hmm. And stem cell therapy doesn't necessarily work that way. Stem cell therapy promotes your own healing. So that is why you can essentially have the exact same treatment, address and improve patients with conditions that are as different as COPD and multiple sclerosis. We've got stem cells, and, and those are the cells that help us regenerate ourselves. So what happens is when you have a specific disease, you're not being able to re regenerate fast enough and to heal fast enough, and you may have other factors that are coming on top of it. So when you add a highly concentrated amount of cells that have been cultured, that have been expanded, that are put right into the place where you want them to go and to act, then you can promote healing in that regard. Why the doctors do not promote this therapy? I don't think it's all the doctors. I think that, you know, I've been in the industry for a decade now, and <laughs> the landscape has certainly changed in terms of adoption and acceptance. When I first started, nobody wanted to hear about it, right? And we would still hear that, oh, no, that doesn't exist, uh, or that simply doesn't work, or that's a scam and whatnot. And as time has progressed, we've had some a few doctors started adopting this, mostly in the orthopedic field. But then we're also seeing a lot more of a acceptance as we see more clinical trials happening, as we see more doctors doing it, as we see more patients requesting treatment. Because what's really happening here is that I don't like throwing doctors under the bus in a way, but what happens is that when you go to medical school and you train for a certain amount of years, and then you learn, you go through your residency, you're essentially learning from somebody who's been practicing for X amount of years before. And, and everyone's going to say, no, 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 we stay up. Really the bulk of your training, your expertise, you are literally just acquiring it by observing 
mm-hmm. other doctors by shadowing them, by, by spending time with them from stuff that they used to do or that they've been doing for X amount of years. Now, when you go back, those doctors learned the bulk of their skills and their expertise from watching doctors who had been practicing 15 years before, 20 years before, 30 years before. So really, it's rather outdated in terms of the clinical skills. When you suddenly come with something that is so different to what we're used to, and we're challenging the status quo, and somebody says, listen, I went to 10 years of schooling and residency, and then I've had 12 or 15 years of clinical expertise. You're not here to tell me that there's something that that makes everything that I've been doing so far in my career obsolete. It's a hard pill to swallow. However, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of doctors start seeing, you know what? Maybe, maybe this, there is something else to this. And the reason I didn't use it before is because it simply didn't exist or because I didn't know about it, not because I was incompetent. So we're seeing a lot more adoption now. However, this is still, there's still some ways to go and you will still find yourself in a doctor's office and you might still find yourself visiting your neurologist and saying, listen, I'm really considering this. I'm tired of, of, of the status quo of just take this medication and we'll see you in six months um, just to see how, how much worse off you are. And, and it is patients who are taking the stance and saying, you know what, that's not good enough for me. I need to look at alternatives. So really what's been driving the growth of regenerative medicine in terms of clinical applications, because clinical research is incredibly expensive and pharmaceutical uh, companies who normally fund clinical research, they really don't have a lot of interest in funding um, something like this that will give them no profit. So in order to fund this, most clinics, most research centers, like the one that I helped set up in, in Cancun that I ran for several years, we need to rely on patients actually getting the treatment and paying for it. So it is these patients who have who have really helped us move the field forward saying, you know what, it makes sense to try something different. And there is science backing it up. It's just, we need more clinical research and clinical data and long-term results because even the patients that we treated 10 years ago, they only have 10 years follow-up studies at the very best case scenario. We're still growing. It is becoming more widely accepted and adopted thankfully. So uh, we understand a different kind of stem cells therapy. So for multiple sources, which is a particular therapy that a person should go for? Stem cell therapy, you can divide it based on where the cells are obtained. So what is the source of the stem cells? And then you can talk about the treatment mechanism, right? So first let's talk about the source of the cells. There's two big ways of obtaining stem cells. One of them is called autologous, which means from the same patient. So whether you grab them from fat, from bone marrow, you can even get them from from blood. There's there's several sources of stem cells in our own body. So those are autologous transplant. On the other hand, you have allogeneic stem cells, which basically means that these are cells from another person. So it isn't the same species. So if, if we were talking about veterinary medicine, it would be from a dog to, to a different dog. And since we're talking obviously about people, it has to be from a different person. And now that we've understood two types of, uh, of, of sources of stem cells, in my personal opinion, for patients with multiple sclerosis, just as it is with patients with other autoimmune disorders like lupus, fibromyalgia, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I would always, always, always recommend autologous stem cell therapy. So from your own bone marrow, from your own adipose tissue, from your own tissues. So can we just say that all the kind of MS can be treated by stem cell therapy? No, there is, there's always caveats. General medicine or stem cell therapy as a whole is, is a tool in a physician's toolbox. It depends on what the physician thinks, because if the doctor who has to be knowledgeable both in stem cells and in multiple sclerosis considers that that one particular patient can benefit from stem cell therapy, regardless of the diagnosis, regardless of the label that the the type of MS has. It has to be evaluated by a physician who can understand the pathophysiology of the disease, the conditions and the particularities and different variables of that specific patient and the responses of the stem cells in in a person, right? We really need to get you to talk to the medical team and they will be able to evaluate and say, you know what, maybe yes. And these are kind of like the improvements that you could expect. And in certain cases, they'll say, you know what, it won't hurt, but the likelihood of improvement is is rather 
uh, is rather low, maybe. And it has nothing to do with the specific type of MS. It has to do with the history of the patient, with the progression of the disease, and with a lot of different variables that have to be considered on a one-to-one basis. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Right one. And if you would like to speak to me about these things, just just head on over to my website, drinestomd.com forward slash stem cells and book a call with me, a brief call with me. uh, And I can help you figure it out and maybe, you know, refer you to a facility that can serve you. Thank you so much again, doctor, for your time and have a wonderful day. Thank you for the invite. Thank you, warriors, for being with us. I hope you found this session useful. We will be back again next week with another informative session. So, don't forget to subscribe and reserve. Just 10 minutes for MS. No, you're not alone.